Hello, my friends. Welcome to Beersmith Podcast number 54. Got an interesting show today. We've got a couple of people that are just starting a pro brewery, and so we're going to walk through what uh, some of the challenges that they're going through right there. Uh, just got one quick announcement on BeersmithRecipes.com. I actually upped the storage for everybody by about 50%. That includes both free and paid members on BeersmithRecipes.com. Uh, that recipe storage site has really exploded recently. It's uh, got some 47,000 recipes stored on it now which is pretty incredible. So uh, so I encourage you to check that out. That's beersmithrecipes.com, and, of course, that's integrated with our software and our mobile versions. Uh, now, without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I have Jacob McKean from Modern Times Brewery in San Diego and Michael Tonsmeyer from the ManFermentationist.com. Uh, they're in a bit of a unique situation. Jacob is just starting a brewery in San Diego, and Michael signed up to develop many of his beer recipes from the other side of the country. Michael actually lives here uh, near me in D.C. So that gives us a unique opportunity to talk about not only how to get into professional brewing, but also how a lot of the recipes are developed and commercialized. Uh, you can track uh, Jacob's new brewery. Uh, he has a blog at moderntimesbeer.com if you want to follow their progress. And I'd like to welcome you both to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here again. Great to have you back, Michael. And Jacob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. You're in the middle of uh, starting up your first small brewery in San Diego. Uh, yep. Can you say a few words on, on how you got started with, uh, with building this new brewery? Sure. Um, so I guess uh, I've, I've been involved in craft beer for a while. Uh, I worked at Stone Brewing Company uh, for the last for two years before I left to uh, work on Modern Times full time. <clears throat> and uh, I was a communication specialist there. Uh, meaning I focused on the marketing and uh, uh, consumer interaction. Oh, man, I'm sorry. My voice is That's totally okay. terrible. Just press ahead. <clears throat> Jesus. <clears throat> um, and before working at Stone, uh, I was uh, doing some freelance writing. I wrote for some beer publications. Um, but I was sort of just generally a beer geek. I was trading beers, brewing a lot of my own beer. And uh, at that point, starting a brewery was really just a vague, distant idea. Uh, but after working at Stone for two years, uh, my father retired and offered to help me raise the capital uh, to start the brewery. And so I just sort of jumped at the opportunity and figured that was my chance to do it. And I really wanted to stay in San Diego. And um, so, yeah, I, I left my job and went ahead and did it. Took the leap, huh? Yeah, it was terrifying. And uh, Michael, where did you uh, join the project, and how did you get started in this whole thing? Sure. Um, as Jacob mentioned, he used to be a, a big beer nerd, beer trader, and probably, what, three, three and a half years ago now, he shot me a message over Beer Advocate or over email or something like that and said, hey, love your blog. If you're willing to send me uh, some some of your homebrew, I'm willing to go around San Diego and get you whatever you want from Ale Smith and Alpine and Lost Abbey. And I said, what a sucker this guy is for a couple of bottles of homebrew. He's going to send me all sorts of delicious stuff. So I sent him some stuff. And then uh, when he was looking to start the brewery, he contacted me and I did everything in my power to say no. I said, I'm not moving to San Diego. I said, I'm, I really don't know what, what it is that I can do for you out here. And he said, Develop some recipes uh, with me, brew them, send me send me some bottles of each one, and uh, and we'll go from there. Now, Jacob, you've uh, you've had some of the harder parts here. You've had to had to work through <laughs> a lot of the business end of setting up a new brewery. What are some of the steps involved in uh, in setting <laughs> up a new brewery? Oh man, we'd be here all night. Um, well, I mean, ironically, talking to Mike was was like the first step for me. I just knew. <laughs> As soon as I, I had the opportunity uh, that I wanted to work with him on it. So not too long after I left my job. How long ago uh, was that? When did you actually get I mean, How long did this process take? Because I know you haven't opened yet. So we're right. What, so what right now uh, we're at one year of working full time uh, on Modern Times. And it will be at least six more months uh, before the brewery is open. So 18 months total. So about a year and a half process. Yeah, just working on startup. Um, so the steps of starting a brewery, uh, well, it depends if you were born extremely wealthy, uh, if you were, uh, the whole thing goes a lot faster. 
How to make a small um, small fortune in brewing, right? You start with a large right. fortune. Yeah, I mean, I think the market's probably changed a little bit since uh, that was the common saying in the industry. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the first step for me was putting, you know, incorporating, putting together an offering memorandum, and uh, going out and raising the money. Uh, that was that right there was six months, uh, and that was really really challenging. So, I mean, how do you do that? How do you go out and talk people into investing in your new brewery? Well, it's harder than you might imagine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people who are professional investors are not beer geeks, certainly, uh, or in most cases aren't even aware uh, that craft beer exists. And so you, for a lot of people, I really had to start from scratch uh, and explain the whole concept and then after convincing them that craft beer was a realistic business idea, I then had to explain why I was the right guy to uh, to manage their money. And, um, you know, that was just a lot of pitching, a lot of handing out business plans, a lot of talking people through it one step at a time, uh, a lot of rejection, travel. Uh, it was it was a big hassle. I, I would have taken the born wealthy option if it was presented to me. <laughs> yeah, me, too. So uh, so what uh, so what are the other steps, though? Obviously, you, so you get your financing. Right. So, well, during all that, there's a lot else going. I mean, that's the thing. It's it's never one step at a time. It's always 15 steps happening simultaneously, and you're in varying varying degrees of completion. Um, so even during fundraising, you know, like I was working with Mike on recipe formulation. I was searching for a location. Um, I started the graphic design stuff very early on. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. Just a, a million. I was making decisions about packaging and equipment and uh, just there's an endless number of things that need to be decided. And so all of this was really happening simultaneously. And it, the goal was to be ready to hit the ground running as soon as I had the money in the bank. Um, and when I did, you know, I was already three quarters of the way there on five other steps and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, after fundraising, I just went really hard on looking for a location. That's probably the biggest thing that dictates so many things that come after it. Uh, I looked at virtually every available site um, in in the region I was looking for. <clears throat> Managed to find a really great building that hadn't been on the market in about twenty five years, um, and then you know working out the lease was not easy either. And it's just you know one thing after another, you're just like slogging through six feet of dirty oatmeal trying to get to that finish line, um, and then finally you know signed the lease. Had to decide on contractor and architects. I had to work with them on the site plan, the layout, you know, permitting, on and on and on like that. Now, I noticed you haven't mentioned any beer yet. Beer is not. Uh, <laughs> this is. I've essentially had to outsource uh, a lot of my dealing with beer to Mike. Um, you know, he he really gets to do all the fun part. Um, I, I pay him to do the fun part essentially. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, because the reality is, you know, my days are already. <laughs> I mean, they they start you know at six thirty in the morning and stretch late at night. Uh, so w during what time I would be home brewing and you know cleaning carboys and buying ingredients and all that kind of stuff, you know I, I don't know when that would be. So um, in order to make as much progress on the recipes as I wanted to make, I really had to have someone else working on them a lot from the very beginning. Um, so you know. Mike played that role, and I play. I've been playing the role essentially of of setting up the business and getting the operation up and running. Um, we've had a lot of communication though uh, about the recipes. That's kind of like the only way I can get myself involved in in this is to talk to him and exchange a million emails about exactly what we're going to do, what styles we're going to make, what ingredients we're going to use, yeast strains, so on and so forth. So. Yeah. Honestly, dealing with Mike is kind of what I do, do for fun, <laughs> even though it's still work. Uh, it's it's like my escape into beer from yeah. the logistics of actually making beer, making beer commercially. Yeah. Well, Michael, you uh, you've been involved in this long distance recipe development, mm -hmm. and you've generated some interesting discussions. I was wondering if you could just maybe give us an example of uh, you know how you go about collaborating on a recipe uh, long yeah. distance. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of home brewers, I, I think home brewers are split. There's some home brewers who really love dialing in recipes, and that's never the sort of home brewer I was. I'm At most, maybe I'd brewed out of 150 or so batches before this whole thing got started. You know, maybe I'd brewed three or four IPAs and three or four Imperial Stouts and a Belgian Wit and four Saisons and... And but even within those those sort of general styles, you know, I wasn't really focusing on 
minor tweaks, minor adjustments. I wanted to brew something new and fun every time I brewed. And every once in a while, I'd get back to something. And so I'm not the sort of person who I, I couldn't go to Jacob and say, hey, here are these six recipes that I've, I've done 15 or 20 times each and dialed in, and I think they're perfect. What do you think of them? How should we tweak them? We were really starting in a lot of cases um, from the, the ground floor of a recipe. Um, often it would start with uh, both of us agreeing that one or two commercial examples were really terrific beers, but maybe we could change it a little this way. Or wouldn't it be better if, if a beer with that malt profile had a hop character more like this one, but we'll also dry it out? And, and some of these recipes have gone from, I, we, we had a beer that was loosely based or inspired by Trogue's Nugget Nectar. I think at this point has no ingredients <laughs> in common with Trogue's <laughs> Nugget Nectar. It, it, it started there. And then as we brewed it through multiple iterations, it sort of drifted to um, where we where we like the flavor based on the way it tasted, not based on how cool the ingredients sounded or on some, you know, historic or, um, you know, philosophical level. It, it really is about making beers that are delicious. Um, and I, I think sort of we're hoping for beers that are going to be sessionable that, that you can drink a lot of, but really beer nerd session beers, things that, um, you know, maybe you could knock back one watching a football game and not really notice it. But if you wanted to warm it up a little and, you know, really stick your nose in there, you'd really get a lot of it, layers of flavor and, and those sorts of things. Um, so, for for example, right now we're, uh, Jacob, actually, we're talking over email earlier today about a Saison recipe we've been developing. And we did the first batch uh, last summer and we split between two different yeast strains. We used uh, two strains from White Labs. Saison 2 and Saison 3. Uh, and we had a lot of spelt in it. Um, and I'd never used spelt before, but it seemed like uh, a, a cool ingredient. It's an ancient form of wheat uh, that's high in protein. It can add a lot of body. This is a Saison we're looking at that's probably going to be high 4% alcohols, low 5%, somewhere in that uh, really moderate range. And so we we're thinking hopefully the protein could boost the body. But it, it just, the spelt really didn't add much. Um, and the two yeast strains we used, neither of them were exactly what we were looking for. So now we're switching that spelt to wheat, uh, and we're going to give uh, Y-E's, uh French Saison 3711 a shot. Um, and that's just sort of going to be, as, as soon as we can get the base recipe, and that's when we're going to start playing with other things. Are we going to spice it? Are we going to use chamomile or black pepper? Um, should it be hoppier? Should it be drier? You know, we, it's sort of a, an ongoing discussion, but we're going to base that on how this batch tastes. Um, and really, you have to figure out the yeast strain for something like that before you can figure out what spices would com would complement it. Cool. Um, well, Jacob, I, you've you've had a number of... Go ahead, Jacob. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say it? that uh, I have no idea if any other brewery is there, like does it this way. <laughs> so say. If, if anyone's looking for like a model for how commercial recipes are developed, this is almost certainly not it. Um, especially, you know, with Mike being on the East Coast and me being here and the shipping and all that. I mean, uh, it, it is a funky system that we have come up with. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, it is... It's basically just the best version that we could figure out <laughs> of making this this setup work. So, um, you and know, the, and I, the packaging I, for me has really been the the biggest uh, issue with this whole thing. Is I'm used to, you know, brewing an IPA and putting it into the keg, and and the furthest that that IPA gets from the keg before it's drank is about you know pouring a growler an hour before a homebrew club meeting. And with this, we've been dealing with beer guns and counter pressure fillers and and shipping you know, four or five days to San Diego and then having it, you know, in Jacob's possession in his fridge for weeks or months before tastings or investor meetings or distributor meetings or his evaluation can can take place for all of those bottles. So, I mean, so, I mean Michael, you've been the pilot, pilot brewery, really, right? Yeah, I, exactly. And um, it's it's I've, he's been getting about uh, six bombers from every batch just because shipping costs. I mean, I, I could box up, you know, a whole batch, but he'd be paying another couple hundred dollars to get it all out there. And at a certain point, it's not worth having, you know, two cases of best fresh IPA if he's not going to be able to get to them for, you know, six months or something. Well, what are the, uh, what are some of the considerations that come into play when you're developing, you say, for a commercial size batch as opposed to a homebrew size batch? 
Um, I, I think Jacob will be able to really talk about this too. But sure. um, for me, as as a home brewer, what you're going to put into a beer, you only have to worry about that one batch. If if I can get enough uh, Nelson Savin hops for this batch of IPA, it doesn't matter. If I can't, if I if next time I brew an IPA, I can't get Nelson, and I have to use something else. That's not a big deal. Uh, with commercial brewing, you have to worry about hop contracts and and that sort of thing. In in some cases, uh, multiple years out in the future, some of these new aroma varieties, these really oil saturated, the Citras, Simcos, Amarillos of the world, uh, a lot of the New Zealand varieties are 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 tough to come by. And Jacob's been doing gangbusters, getting us some, getting us any to play with, and, and actually gotten pretty good amounts of some of them. Jacob, your thoughts? Yeah, I guess the difference. <clears throat> I mean, I was a home brewer long before I worked in commercial beer, but now when I look at a recipe. You know, I first look at it from a sensory standpoint, like, what is this going to taste like? Is it something I'd want to drink and sell? Uh, but then I start looking at it as a logistical problem. Um, and every recipe is kind of its own unique logistical problem, right? <laughs> so it's not just, <clears throat> it, I mean, it gets really complex. But, I mean, you know, you got to think in terms of silos full of malt, for instance. So using base malt. That, is, that differs from batch to batch is certainly achievable, but it means I'd be asking my brewing team to manually load, you know, 30 barrel batch. It's like 2,500 pounds of grain from bags. You know, that may be fine for a one time deal, but, you know, are they going to be excited about doing that weekly? Yeah. Um, you know. How many, how many, and, uh, how large a system are you installing? How large uh, are we're, go <clears throat> we're going with the 30 barrel system. Mm -hmm. um, so this is on the large side uh, of startup production scale. Um, I, I did the, the math out at one point, and, and essentially, as soon as modern times, that first batch of beer will be more beer than I have brewed in my eight or nine years as a home brewer, <laughs> or a very similar <laughs> amount. So 30 barrels, as, 30 barrels, just to give people an idea, how much, uh, how much hops, how much grain goes into, say, an average batch? Well, <clears throat> I mean, between 1,500 and 2,500 uh, pounds of malt. Wow. Um, and then, you know, for, the, for hops, it really varies by recipe. But, you know, typical would be anywhere from, uh, you know, for like a really lighter beer, like a wit, maybe half a pound of hops per barrel to like a really big IPA would be maybe, you know, three or four pounds per barrel. So you could be talking, you know, 120 pounds total of hops. Um, you know, your yeast pitch initially is going to be uh, probably about a barrel uh, at least. And then uh, I guess most commercial brewers tell me that you typically scale the hops down quite a bit when you go up in size, right? Yeah. Because you get actually, higher utilization, right? Well, on, IB, <clears throat> on IBUs, yeah, definitely, um, because for a variety of reasons. But, yeah, when we were at, when I was at Stone, I mean, we were getting 45% of our IBUs, I think, from, uh, from Whirlpool hops. So, you know, you're, you're talking about a totally different system of extracting bitterness from hops uh, on the commercial scale. But as far as dry hops uh, and aroma goes, and, uh, you're, that's actually a little bit of a mystery. Um, I know you did your last podcast with Stan Aronimus, and yeah. he talked about uh, really widely differing opinions on how best to utilize aroma hops on the commercial scale. And um, that's kind of a riddle I've been trying to solve uh, without a whole lot of success. I mean, there are people making really fantastic hoppy beers that are using they're dry hopping with like half a pound per barrel and then there are others that are using two to three pounds per barrel um and you know not necessarily getting the same results but there's clearly a lot to figure out here and there's a lot of variables involved um so we're still kind of exploring that but it does make hop contracting really complex when i have no idea exactly how much of a certain hop we're going to yeah, use i actually wrote another article on hop oils this week but I, one of the issues right. is the hop oils tend to boil off uh as mm -hmm. you get into the higher temperature regime, so you really need to add them after the boil, and you even need to add them a li little bit after the hops have, after the wort has cooled down, in order to use a, a lot of the hop oils effectively, depending on what effect you're trying to get and which hop, hop oils you're trying to extract. But sure, yeah. Although I heard recently that uh, Avery has switched to um, all whirlpool hops; they've eliminated dry hopping entirely and have increased the quantity of hops a lot, and just do, doing it all whirlpool. And they claim that in blind tasting, you can't tell the difference. I don't well, know. Well, I mean, you can, certainly you can isomerize hops below boiling, right? So right. You, get, you get bitterness when, when it's still below boiling. Sure. Uh, I don't know what temperature they're doing their whirlpool additions out, though. Yeah, you know, that that really no varies idea. from, from yeah. system to system. Um, so, yeah, there's 
from one brewing system to another, you know, you, you can't just translate recipes directly. There's really a lot of variation in process. I mean, for instance, we'll be making the plan as of now, at least is to make use of a hop back in a lot of our hoppy beer recipes. Um, I'm a fan of hop backs for a variety of reasons. I, you know, when I've gotten Mike started using one on our pilot batches, but, you know, even so, I think the jury's still kind of out on whether or not it's a lot better or different in the final product than late additions or, or using the same volume of hops and dry hopping or what, you know. Um, so really, in, until you have the time and resources to do a whole lot of side-by-side -side testing and making really small, uh, single variable tweaks to recipes, it's really hard to know uh, what any of this stuff does. Um, so, yeah. Well, Michael, uh, I was wondering about your thoughts on beer styles for the brewery. Uh, you know, what's the trade-off you make between trying to pick, say, a popular beer style and trying to pick a, uh, you know, a style that might be a lot more fun to brew, but uh, <laughs> but perhaps uh, uh, may not appeal to the mass market? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're never going to appeal to, let's just say, the beer mass market. We're hoping to appeal at least to the craft beer mass market. Right. Um, and, and the styles we're going with are, I, I don't think any of them are too weird, but they're all, maybe there's a little tweak to them or, or something that makes them just a little bit different that there's certainly people have done them before. So for example, we're doing uh, an American wheat beer, you know, American wheat is often at a brew pub. That's sort of their, their oh, way. Hey, hey, you guys got Bud Light. No, we, we've got this American wheat though, 11 IBUs. You know, no malt character, no hop character, no yeast character. It's just clean. And what we've been planning on doing, and we've we've done uh, three test batches now, we're planning a fourth, is uh, really heavy aromatic citrus, uh, citra, amarillo, hopped, um, more malt character, you know, still keeping the yeast pretty light, but, but having um, something that's not super bitter, and so you're not going to turn off people who aren't, you know, drinking double IPAs or whatever. But I think a lot of those aromatics you get, and particularly not only the citrus, but the tropicals and the melons from Citra, um, have a lot wider appeal. And, and at, at 35 or 40 IBUs and a four and a half, five percent beer, I, I think you're going to get a lot of people interested in something like that. And then similar story on an oatmeal coffee stout or uh, the Saison or a wit with hibiscus. Um, these are these are beers that I, I think are loads of fun and, and the sorts of beers that I wouldn't want to just buy one bomber of. I would want to bring a six pack home of and, you know, and enjoy it and um, have it have something that is exciting, but still really accessible. And the one one thing I'd add to that is that at least for me, like commercial calculations really were not the driving force behind the recipes. And I know a lot of breweries say, you know, we brew whatever we want to drink. And it's kind of like a trope at this point. Everybody says it. But, I mean, really, in this case, it was it, what was driving the style choices was the, my drinking habits, essentially. Um, you know, I it got to a point in my sort of evolution as a beer geek where all I wanted to do was drink the, the sledgehammer beers. You know, the huge, high-gravity Russian Imperial Stouts, the double IPAs. Barely. Yeah, it was like one bomber of each, never to be repeated, and I would just trade for them until I got to try everything. So what, what, are, what are a couple of the styles you settled on? Well, so like Mike was saying, the Hoppy Wheat Beer, mm -hmm. um, the Amber IPA, the Oatmeal Coffee Stout, the Saison. Um, we'll definitely do, you know, a standard or, or more traditional IPA, a double IPA, that sort of thing. But, you know, the as far as the stuff that will be, our, what I think will be driving our volume, it'll be the stuff that's in the middle to lower end of the ABV range that really focuses on aromatics. Uh, so the hoppy wheat beer, like Mike was saying, very focused on citra hop aromatics. The oatmeal coffee cell will be really focused on coffee aromatics. Uh, the amber IPA, which will be a little bit higher gravity, um, is going to be really focused on Nelson hops and their, their unique aroma. Um, and the Saison is going to be really yeast driven. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's really reflective of, of, I think, my wanting to do nuanced, complex beers that have a ton of character but aren't sledgehammers, that aren't those, you know, massive novelty beers that sometimes are really amazing and delicious but aren't the kind of thing, like Mike was saying, that you want to drink in volume. Um, and not not to say that we won't do any of that stuff. I mean, we're planning on having a barrel seller. We're planning on on doing some some bigger seasonal stuff. But that's not the stuff that's going to be the big big focus, at least at this stage. I mean, I think those are the things that will will get more attention 
once we get the the core beers really dialed in and, right. and to the point that we are so happy with them um, that we we can't imagine you know, you, any change you make makes them worse. Yeah, I right. I know Jacob mentioned at one point that uh, the beer styles actually <sighs> drive some of the equipment choices that you make. Mm-hmm. How do, how does that work? Um. <clears throat> well, so. Well, it's complicated. I mean, even starting with the 30-barrel system, you know, I mean, that limits your choices in a lot of ways, too, right? I mean, if you're on a 10-barrel pub system, some of the stuff I was talking about earlier with base malts and stuff like that, you really do have a lot more flexibility because the volume doesn't become this whole logistical problem unto itself. Um, But then when you're talking about process flow, you know, how the beer is being made really influences, like, how many vessels you need, uh, whether or not you need to be the ability to do step mashing. Um, you know, in, in like, a homebrewing setup, doing a step mash is often as simple as turning on a burner mm-hmm. uh, and using a thermometer, you know, in a uh, in a 30-barrel brew- brewing environment. Uh, doing a step mash is at, at least a twenty to $50,000 decision. <laughs> um, and you're wow, talking about really? a, a totally different set of equipment there. You're t- you need a jacketed mash tun, uh, which is a separate vessel which needs to be shipped from God knows where, which then needs to be installed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's like a lot to it. So you don't get, it's not just, I mean, it, you lose a lot of that freedom from home brewing and, and, you know, what you gain is of course, consistency and volume. Um, so every one of those decisions, you know, dry hopping is another thing. You need to have ports on your fermenters in order to be able to add in dry hops. Most fermenting vessels aren't really designed for dry hopping because they were designed before it became fashionable. Uh, so that's why people have been doing things like taking Grundies and filling them with hops and, you know, filling them with CO2 and then running them through a pump. And now, like, you know, we got our fermenting vessels designed with six inch dry hop ports so that someone can get up there on a scissor lift with a 44 pound box of hops and dump it in through a giant funnel, with, you know, attached to a tri clamp fitting. Um, you know, it's just when you scale this stuff up, it's not as simple as just using more of it. You have to have a process in place to, to make it happen. Um, and all that stuff. I mean, you know, just the scissor lift that I used in that example is is a sixty seven hundred dollar piece of equipment. So it's like all of this ends up becoming like these these financial and economic and logistical problems that you end up having to solve. Um, I want to ask Michael, uh, what is uh, what are some of the challenges you've had doing uh, doing a pilot brewery? You know, sort of this remote pilot brewery and developing these pilot batches. What are what are some of the things you've had to work through uh, as you've done that? Um, I, just to, to give a, for example, uh, the distance, one of the big issues that we, we really sort of ignored at first, sort of our, our first reaction was to try to brew our ideal beer, sort of ignoring a lot of the commercial considerations and then figure out how can we make those same flavors, you know, on, on that sort of scale. And so one of the things I've just recently uh, been doing now that Jacob has informed me that the reverse osmosis filter has been one of the things that was cut out uh, <laughs> due to these various other decisions. That's, is that's a $15,000 tra- piece of equipment, FYI. <laughs> well, and, and, and not to mention that, that San Diego isn't exactly an area not known for brewing. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of breweries there that do fantastic beer with the, the local carbon filtered water. Right. Um, but I've been I've been using the San Diego water report and the Washington, D.C. water report and then adjusting to get what I what I think we'll probably be doing in San Diego, for example, for a hoppy beer, that base water carbon filtered and then plus um, gypsum to get it up to about one hundred and seventy five parts per million sulfate and then uh, and calcium up to about uh, seventy eight or eighty parts per million. Um, but from D.C., that involves diluting with distilled water and adding back. <laughs> um, San Diego has reasonably high amounts of uh, magnesium compared to D.C., sodium, um, a little bit more chloride, a couple of other. And, and so you sort of have to conjigger it into a way. It's it's not the sort of water treatment I would ever do otherwise. It is a water treatment solely based on how will this taste in San Diego it won't be exactly the same. I mean, the, the thing with making water adjustments is you have to add salts. And right. salt is two different ions. And so when you're adding, you know, magnesium sulfate, well, that, you know, to get the magnesium up, you're also pushing the, the well, sulfate course. up. And then to, oh, well, so that's too much sulfate. Okay, well, then we want more cal. You know, and you often get stuck in a situation where there's just one ion that isn't close enough and, and you make a decision based on, um, you know, which which ions you think are more important or how, you know, do you get, you know, 
yeah, more I had of build, them. I had to build yeah. an optimizer in my latest program to try and figure that out. So it kind of does a least squares fit there and tries to pick the right number. But exactly. So how, but how, how, big, a, how big a batch are you working with? So I'm just doing five gallon batches. Five gallon and part, batches. And sometimes I'll do ten if we're doing, say, we're splitting uh, the saison. We did a ten gallon batch, and so we could split it the same wort between two different yeasts. Um, but really, o- often the problem I'm having is I can't get through the beer fast enough because I'm only sending Jacob about uh, maybe a third of the batch. And so I've still got two thirds of the batch to get through. And I'm trying to brew at least twice a month. And I, I clearly don't have enough friends or something. Um, but but often, time, you know, it's, does, does time come into play here, too? I assume, you know, with a commercial beer, you probably want to get it to market fairly quickly. You don't want it sitting around well, in storage for months like like yeah. it might be in my cellar here. Definitely no, and and it's even little process things like that. Exactly how and and how long do we dry hop for? And uh, what I what my traditional method had been was to do uh, half the dry hops in either primary or secondary for warm for about a week, then into a keg on dry more dry hops for until it was gone. And the problem there is you really can't keg hop. You know we'll, we'll be able at the tasting room at modern times. I'm sure we'll do a lot of fun you know, one keg only, you know, hey, here's here's the Amber IPA, double dry hopped with Simcoe or whatever. Um, but for most of it, you know, you're sending a keg out and the, the beer has to be ready, carved, and then in the keg, not, not sitting on dry hops, not, you know, going through some additional flavor development. Um, and so for the third test batch of the Amber, we're just doing all the dry hops right at the end of primary. Uh, I'm agitating four or five times a day, just trying to get higher contact, um, trying to replicate what breweries are doing with either pumps or agitators um, to try to extract flavors really quickly um, without having to wait the the traditional sort of one to two weeks. Um, so we'll see how that works. I mean, it's it's one of those things we're trying. I know Jacob was originally hoping I would use a, a gigantic stir plate to keep it agitated, um, but I'm I'm not a car a glass carboy guy, so that uh, that idea fizzled out. I got a couple here if you need to borrow some, but uh, we're still going to try the gigantic stir plate, by the way. <laughs> okay. Hey, Jacob, uh, you you got a number of blog posts. You you got a great blog going, by the way, and I'll, I'll mention oh, the you. site again. It's at moderntimesbeer dot com. Um, but Jacob, you got a number of blog posts uh, where you talk about the fact that starting a brewery <laughs> is mostly not about beer, and uh, I know you mm-hmm. mentioned some of that at the beginning of the show, but I was wondering if, if you could share a few more a uh, few more of your thoughts on that topic. Sure. I mean, I th- my big motivation for posting that was that I think a lot of people envision starting a brewery as finally their chance to quit their day job and delve into beer full time. Um, and that's really not what you're doing. I mean, you're delving into construction full time and site location full time and lawyers and accountants and all kinds of stuff full time. But beer is really... You know, ironically, one of the few one of the things you don't have a ton of time for, um, you know, it's it's obviously critical, though. uh, And that's why I've kind of patched together this system with Mike. Um, But, you know, it's if yeah, if you're if your goal is to be really hands on with beer and to really be involved in the kind of discussions you guys are having about water ionization and. Uh, ingredient, you know, specific ingredients and and strategies for extracting hop aroma and things like that. You shouldn't start your own brewery. You should become a professional brewer. You know, that's what the staff does all day. The owner doesn't get to do that. <laughs> um, you know, the owner is is making sure that the taxes are paid on time and um, you know that there aren't too many more tables in the tasting room than the fire marshal says you can have, and you know, like on and on and on like that. I mean, there's just a million things. Um, you know, I spend more time thinking about handicap accessible ramps and doorways than I do thinking about uh, water ionization. You know, it's just it's it's not what business owners do. Um, so, you know, my advice to anyone is if, if you really want to delve in uh, to to the nuts and bolts of brewing, either start a very, very, very small brewery um, or, you know, become a professional brewer or stick with home brewing. I mean, you'll never have as much flexibility as you have uh, as a home brewer. And yeah, you were, I, I mean, you were a pro brewer for a while too, right? Uh, well, I wasn't. I was at Stone, but I was yeah. working in the marketing department. Okay. I was. I actually applied to be an assistant brewer at Stone, but uh, they gave me a marketing job instead. I see. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Michael, uh, what are your what are some of your thoughts on making the leap from home brewer to pro brewer here? I mean, obviously, you got a semi ideal situation here, but uh, 
Yeah, no, and so and that that really is it's it's actually sort of the same as Jacob's story almost. I I I'm not going to be the one who is actually brewing these beers on the commercial scale. Jacob would love for me to move out there and run the barrel cellar and maybe take over the tasting room uh, system. And and I'm hoping to do that for a couple of months after Modern Times gets started. I've I, I'll have seen these these recipes through a year and a half, and I I really want to make sure that they are at least as good and probably a whole lot better on on as he was saying that consistent, you know, process driven uh, thing with with real professional brewers who have done this before uh, and really know all the ins and outs of how to run a system and how to get the protein levels just right and how to get the the fan levels and, and, and all those other things. There's a home brewer. I kind of vaguely know what I'm doing and certainly well enough to, to make a delicious beer that stays well on my keg, but maybe not a beer that I can stick in a, a, in a can and, or a bottle and, and sit on a warm shelf at, a, at a, a beer shop for three months or whatever and still, and still be 95% as good as it was the day it was, was put in there. Um, I mean, for me, it's, it, it, it's that it would be that terror that terror of that first batch of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of ingredients. If I have a junky batch, and it certainly, I mean, it happens to every home brewer, either, you know, with, with all my barrels, some, something gets in there, or I make a stupid choice, or I'm hanging out with my friends brewing, and I get a boil over and lose a gallon, whatever. It's not a big deal. It's, it's you know, 25 bucks worth of stuff, and a lazy Saturday afternoon uh, down the drain, or whatever. It's It's not a big deal on a on a commercial scale, you're you're talking profitability. You're talking too many mistake batches, and the company goes out of business and and whatever. And uh, I think that's the sort of the big difference between being a home brewer and being a pro brewer. It, it really matters how good the beer is. Um, and I think there are a lot of breweries who maybe don't take quality and process nearly as seriously as they should. It's it's amazing how often I buy a six dollar bomber or an eight dollar bomber and it's it's lousy beer it's you know it's not fresh it's oxidized it's over carbonated it's infected it's it's who knows what um but just really not taking those sorts of things seriously i think lots of home brewers and pro brewers get too crazy on the recipes that the recipe is so important when really i think it is those process issues um as i'm, I'm really excited to be going to be learning uh from from the guys who are running the brew house what are they looking for? What are they doing? What do what do they think is important in making uh, a delicious beer? Well, Jacob, I was wondering if you had a few tips for home brewers, maybe uh, either looking to go pro or maybe just looking to make better beer. Well, I, I would tell anybody looking to go pro that they absolutely should work at a commercial brewery before even considering starting their own operation. Um, I would not want to be doing what I'm doing now without the experience I had at Stone. Uh, I think it's absolutely vital. So if, if you're serious about it and you actually you know, want to pursue it as a goal, then get a job at a brewery. I mean, it, it's definitely not going to hurt, you know. Uh, and I see just I, I feel like I see way too many people just diving into it, um, not fully understanding all of the implications uh, and all the possible risks involved. So, um, yeah, you, that's your, your thoughts on making better beer. On making better beer at home, or yeah. uh, um, well, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, that, that's where Mike and I are, are different as home brewers. Before, when I was a home brewer, I was really focused on dialing re- in recipes too, um, and I think that has more to do with my just being a super OCD perfectionist than uh, anything else, and it's just a stylistic thing. I mean, um, you know, I think Mike, is, as you're saying, views it really recreationally. He just happens to be particularly good at it. Um, whereas for me, you know, it was, uh, it was like deeply frustrating to ever make a beer that was less than perfect. And so I spent a lot of my time dialing in recipes and rebrewing batches and making small adjustments. So, um, you know, I, you can either like, as I said at the beginning with uh, being born rich, you can either choose to be, uh, talented or you can, uh, just keep doing it until you get it right. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I would recommend trying it. I think Mike would argue that it's probably an interesting experience for anyone to try anyway, you know, pick a couple of recipes and try to make them as good as they possibly can be. And, uh, that'll probably be a good learning experience for you. No. And, and, and what's really been interesting about this process to me too, is, is having someone else, Jacob, I can't just brew whatever I want. He and I kick back and forth ideas and, and he has strong opinions. I have strong opinions. And I think we, we, you know, try to share the same end vision, but 
with beer, there's a lot of different ways. So you, you were talking earlier about hops. There's all sorts of different ways to use hops. There's all sorts of different ways to get, you know, yeast driven flavors. You can use different strains, different pitching temperatures, different aeration rates, different pitch, you know, different fermentation temperatures. Um, and how you get to that flavor uh, can really uh, show you, you know, what what the goal of the whole thing is. Um, and for me, I, I guess I, I was really lucky in that I tried so many things that when Jacob has an idea, I generally maybe have tried that hop or I've tried that yeast or I've, I've tried enough different things. And maybe if I haven't even done it exactly, you know, the way he, you know, the, the, the recipe that he'd be interested in trying, I can give some feedback on components of that recipe and I've used them in, in other things and have an idea of where it might go or, or if I like that strain or not, or um, maybe something to avoid. Oh, I, I, you know, I've used that strain a couple of times and I know if I pitch it too cold, it won't finish and we'll, we'll end up with a sweet beer and we don't want that or, or whatever. Um, so I, I think there's sort of two sides of the same coin dialing in a recipe. I think you can't, you know, I, I think early on for a homebrewer, it's really important to try to rebrew the same thing a couple of times. But I think if you really want to perfect a recipe, I would save that until after you had brewed enough that you really um, had an idea of what, you know, you'd, you'd tried 40 or 50 yeast strains and you really knew what strains you really liked and which ones you didn't and, and tried a wide chunk of the hops in relatively one or two hop kind of combination so you could really tell what was going on. Um, same thing with malts. You know, it's we, we've gone back and forth on, um, you know, what what our personal preferences are. Um, but even when you talk about malts, I think a lot of people will say, oh, you know, roasted barley, you know, 10, you know, 10 percent roasted barley. But there can be a huge range between breeze roasted barley at 300 level bond and uh, muttons at, at 550 or something like that. I mean, it's it's they're they're not the same at all, even though they have the same name. Um, and so I think learning your ingredients uh, is is really the first step to being a, a really good home brewer or professional brewer. Well, Jacob, we're uh, we're running short on time, but I thought I'd uh, ask you the one question I know you wanted to answer, which is uh, you've written quite a bit about about what's going to make modern times uh, different. Mm-hmm. And so I thought maybe I'd give you a minute or two to to talk to the audience here about uh, what you think is going to make <laughs> modern times brewery different from all the other breweries. Um, well, I, I guess I'll say something that I haven't written uh, in the blog post yet, but I think <clears throat> really the what the concept is behind Modern Times and what will make it different is that um, this is a brewery that's worked on a fairly large scale uh, that has a relatively uh, large resource pool. I went out and raised a ton of money, um, but we're going to be devoting it to making a really exciting, really high quality beer. Um, part of what motivated me was that I saw so many breweries opening up that were working with high volumes and did have a lot of resources, but they were devoting all of that to marketing. Um, and they were putting that money into a uh, beer that really wasn't that exciting. And I just feel like, I, I guess I felt like, why do the people who have all the resources have to be the ones who are trying to make gateway beers, you know, or entry level beers? Uh, I mean, I certainly I want our beers to be accessible. That's part of the concept. But when I say accessible, I don't mean dumbed down. Um, you know, I don't mean compromising quality. I mean beers that are widely available uh, and are likable. Um, so, you know, I, I guess what will really distinguish it is we're going to kind of see, can we take kind of the beer geek formula on the one hand and apply it to a higher volume production focused environment? Um, and that's really, I guess, you know, the difference in a way it's, uh, usually when beer geeks start breweries, they're starting like seven barrel farmhouse operations, you know, and never have the ambition of serving beer beyond their tasting room. And that's totally awesome. And that's great. I love it. You know, I love going to those breweries. I love drinking their beer. Um, but the operation that I was excited about starting was one that was more production focused. Um, my goal is, you know, for the average guy to be able to go, and pick up a world-class six-pack of beer at the supermarket. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, there are some options available in that regard, but there aren't necessarily as many as there should be. Um, so that's that's really what will make Modern Times different, hopefully, if we succeed. Well, I really appreciate you guys both being on the show, and I, I'd actually like to invite you back, uh, if maybe come back uh, next summer after you opened, or maybe in the fall after you got a couple batches under your belt, and talk to us a little bit more about your uh, your experiences. Definitely. That'd be, That'd be a lot of fun. 
Well, thank you for both for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having Back me again. Mike Tonsmeyer is the uh, MadFermentationist.com. And uh, Jacob, I'd like to welcome you, or I'd like to thank you again for appearing on the show. Sure, happy to be here. And again, Jacob McKean is uh, starting a new brewery, and you can track him at ModernTimesBeer.com. Well, a big thank you to Jacob and Michael for appearing on this show, and we were talking a little bit after the show, and they mentioned that they wanted to include a couple of recipes that they're uh, they're getting ready to brew here. So those recipes I'll include in the show notes. You can find the show notes under episode number 54 at Beersmith.com slash blog. And if you have feedback for us, you can leave us a note under this episode there, or you can leave a note also at the discussion forum at Beersmith.com slash forum. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.